Good morning. It's nice to be here in Portugal, a country where they won the, song, the singing contest for Europe. It's nice, to, I, my background, oops, where's my thingy here? And well mentioned the fact that I wrote a book on business process change. Uh, I did that in 2003. Uh, before that, uh, I'd worked for process for a long time, but in the 80s, I wrote another book which actually sold better than the business process book, and that book was a book, Expert Systems, AI, and Business. So I say all this to say that my background is as much in AI, as far as public, as much in AI as in business process. In neither case, well, certainly in the case of AI, I'm not an expert in artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm an expert in how business systems and how companies use business technology. Uh, so I spent most of the 80s giving advice to companies and talking about a book I wrote that basically said, here's how you use AI. By the end of the 90s, AI was over in that round, <laughs> and I had to go back to doing business process. Uh, and in the, again, the 2000, I wrote a book on business process. I say all that to say that I feel like I can switch back and forth of between the two worlds, at least as far as talking to business people and giving advice. Uh, and that's a little bit of what I want to do today. Uh, just introduce AI and talk about how I think it's going to impact business and process work. Let me, a little bit of background here. Let me start off by just throwing three words up here. A couple of years ago, this conference would have been about business process management. Uh, it could as well have been about Lean or Six Sigma or any of the other names that we use for business process. Business process is perennial. Companies always have to improve how they do business. Technology changes, people change, and businesses have to change to survive and to prosper. Uh, in the last Maybe two years, transformation has become a hot term, uh, to the point where some people would say transformation has replaced business process. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I'd say, you know, you need some basic term to describe what we do, and business process works pretty well. If you want to call it transformation instead, that's okay. Um, maybe two or three years ago, it started to be popular to call it digital transformation. Uh, and that was okay. You know, there's a lot of things going on in the internet, which we tend to refer to as digital or media. Uh, and customers certainly have changed the way they think about the world, the way they buy things, the way they interact with companies. So it's completely appropriate to talk about digital transformation. The next term I think you're going to see a lot of is cognitive transformation or AI transformation whichever you prefer, and that's going to be another round, okay? From a process point of view, I think that whatever you call it, <laughs> underneath it's going to be process. We still have to get things done. Uh, we still have to get them done step by step. We still have to understand the sequence of steps that we go through to get things done. We still want to look at those steps to make them more efficient be more effective, so process stays very much in the picture. If you want to put any special emphasis on transformation, it's probably the emphasis that people place when they talk about more disruptive process change. Sometimes you change processes that have been in place for a long time. Sometimes you step back and say, could I be doing this an entirely different way? Uh, could I reinvent my company around some new technology? And those are possibilities too, and, and many companies are doing that. For, for those, if you may have noticed, about a week ago, Ford Motor Company announced that they were going to fire their CEO and replace him. 
Now, this is a guy who's been there for maybe five, six years. Uh, and the, basically, the board said he wasn't moving fast enough. And the person they're going to replace him with is the individual who's the head of their autonomous vehicle program. Okay, so in addition to spending a billion dollars, or committing to spend a billion dollars in the next five years on autonomous vehicles, they're going to move the individual who heads that group to head the entire company. So it's an emphasis on moving AI technology into the very center of management and strategic planning at Ford Motor Company. And, and you'll see more of things like that. What is AI? I've, I've drawn a picture here, and the picture is in the very center, I put core concepts. Uh, and I, I don't think we need to discuss those. They get, they get very technical, and if we were an audience of IT developers, it would be worthwhile. But if we're business people, then the core concepts don't make too much difference to us. The point is what they can do, what we can do with those core concepts. The things that I surround that immediate area with were understand, reason, and learn. Those are three ways of describing what AI systems do, and probably as good as any. And then around that, I put an additional level, and I put natural language interfaces and the Internet of Things. And then I just continued to circle on out. Access to unstructured documents. One of the huge advantages that many of the AI systems are providing at the moment is that they can take text or pictures and they can look at them and deduce things from them, which is to say they can, they can ma do matching and figure out what a particular diagram means. Um, beyond that, I have access to massive databases uh, and things that are available from the cloud and from many platforms. So there is a sense in which AI is a new is, not, is a technology that we're going to use to do all kinds of things. And there's another sense in which if it hadn't come along, we would have had to invent it because we have this digital transformation, this use of interface, and a, a great variety of customers who need to interact with us through smartphones and through various other kinds of media and we need to make that interface very efficient. And a lot of the things we're going to get from AI in the next 10 or 15 years are going to be better ways of doing that. Here's a slightly different picture of the same world. Um, in this case, I emphasized the way that the AI people are more likely to divide the world up. Decision-making, natural language, robotics. The decision-making part is understanding. It's figuring out somehow how to take vocabulary and parse it and figure out what it means. The natural language is being able to talk and read with people. And the robotics includes everything from vision to manipulation to things that, that look like people, but that's a very small part of it. Which most of what I think of as robotics are things like automated cars or big machines that assemble cars, and so forth. So we're talking about a, a great variety of different specific techniques. AI is a, is a group of people in, the, in an IT department in a university. And just like there are people that are, work on databases, and there are people that work on computer languages, there are people that work on AI. And you could say, generally, they're trying to make computers smarter. But that includes a vast range of things. And among those things, most of them are very specific. Okay, so when you say, what is AI? I can't answer it by saying it does this or it does that. I can say it's a whole toolbox of techniques that we're going to be using in different places to do different things. And they all, quote unquote, make computers smarter. But that doesn't mean much. What you really want to know is what can they do for me, specifically. OK, a little history. This is an aside I'm throwing in. I did all this in the 80s. And you might say, well, if AI was, was, was it popular in the 80s, it was at least as popular as it is now. In 1983, all the magazines, all of the literature, 
that people in business literature was filled with articles on artificial intelligence and how it was going to change everything. And we spent six or seven years teaching people about AI, seeing AI used in various applications. And by the 90s, AI had more or less disappeared. And so you might ask me what happened, and I'm happy to tell you. <laughs> the systems that were built were built using particular technology. At the time, it was mostly rule-based systems and inferencing. The techniques worked perfectly well, and they built systems that performed as well as the best human experts in certain areas. Okay, so we built a lot of big systems that were very smart and very efficient. The problem was that the systems did not learn. Okay, and that, what I mean by that is that you built the system by putting rules in. And the big systems would have up to 10,000 or 15,000 rules. And each of the, those rules would be analyzed when you were trying to solve a problem. Okay? The good news was it was much easier to understand. A rule-based system, we can read the rules and we can actually see what the system is trying to do. And there's a sense in which when you look at that, you feel much more comfortable with it. The systems they're building now are not rule-based. They're neural net-based. And it's much harder to figure out what the system is actually doing. The good news, however, is that they now can learn. Neural net systems have the ability to process additional data and draw information from the data and improve. In the 90s, or the eight, late 80s, when we were building these big systems, we built the system, but the fact is, human experts continue to change. We go to conferences and we learn new things. We read books and we learn new things. We practice our profession and we learn new things and we incorporate those. So we keep changing our model and getting better at what we do. These systems that were being built were as good as a human expert when they were finished, but they didn't improve, okay? So if you wanted to improve them, you had to continually add new rules. And it turns out that the process of adding new rules was very expensive, okay? It was, it was too expensive, in fact, to make it worthwhile. And so you spent a large amount of money building one of these systems, and then you found out it cost you almost as much money year in and year out to maintain them, and it wasn't a cost-effective proposition. Okay, so there's a sense in which we've been through AI once, <laughs> and it's not that it didn't work, but it, it wasn't valuable enough to make it worthwhile. And so the people in the AI in the universities continued to work and develop systems, and they put a lot of energy into learning systems. The other thing was in the 80s, as an aside, that we focused almost on entirely on knowledge-based systems, on systems that use knowledge to solve problems. Natural language was not advanced enough to be useful in the 80s, and robotics was not advanced enough, or at least the more sophisticated robotics was not advanced enough to be useful. So we only had one of those three circles that we were focused on, knowledge. Okay, this round, we're going to use knowledge and natural language and robotics together. So we've got a much bigger bag of, of tricks, if you would, that we're gonna be able to deploy and use. And if in fact the systems can learn, as at least so far they seem to be able to do, it should be very much more valuable, much more useful to business people. Okay, but I warn you, <laughs> I don't want to be cynical. I'm, I'm very optimistic. I mean, the, as soon as I learned about AI, I became committed to the idea that sooner or later we're going to be able to use computers to do almost any of the things that we imagine them doing. The problem is just the time and the efficiency of whether they're really effective. Um, the first round of AI in the 80s simply wasn't, it, was, it did a lot of interesting things, but it wasn't efficient enough and effective enough to be useful from a business point of view. Hopefully this round will be. However, you take everything you read with a grain of salt, you try it out, and determine whether it really works for you or not before you decide that's the thing you want to do. Okay, some case studies. 
Let me just get a little more specific about what I mean by AI. Certainly, Google Translate. Uh, how many of you have used Google Translate for something? Okay, so most everybody. How many have used it in the last like three or four months? Okay, a good number more. It, most people claim that the new version of Google Translate is much better than the older version. In other words, they, they, Google introduced an AI version of the thing, a neural network based version of Google Translate about six months ago at this point. Okay, and it led to a major improvement in the way that translation works. I have a couple of friends who run a company that does translation in Japan for large Japanese companies, and they're feared at this point they're going to be bankrupt. In other words, it has gotten so much better that the, the computer companies where their primary clients are using Translate rather than hiring humans to do the translation, and that wasn't true six months ago. Six months ago, everybody would have agreed that you let the machine do the first cut and then humans had to finish it up. So we've made a major step forward in this point. Uh, Frantic Robotics. Frantic is the company, the world's largest manufacturer of industrial robots. Okay, so when you see pictures of an automobile factory and you see the machines come down and weld all the doors and so forth, those are most likely Frantic robots that are doing that. The company is now committed to launching a new line of robots with neural networks in them. This is, they can do things like, they can learn very rapidly. That's the important key here. So they can learn to do things like pick widgets out of a box and put them, sort them out. And they can learn it in about eight hours, okay? At 90% accuracy, okay? 90% accuracy is as good as a human could program the robots to do, in other words. So what used to be a task, you bought the robot and then a human analyze what had to be done and then program the robot to do it. You now buy the robot, you give it the example, and the robot then tries it over and over again and basically learns to do it itself, okay? It turns out it's as good as people if you let a robot learn by itself. If you take several robots and have them all learn and then take what they learn and put it together and spread it back out to them, in other words, if they share the knowledge they learn, they learn much faster and at a much higher rate. Okay, so this is major company, major robotics program. Shifting the Toyota production line. Toyota is experimenting with the production line where each of the robots on the production line knows how to do multiple different things and can respond and change what it does almost immediately. So what they, you can do is you can start a car. If you say, okay, I'm going to assemble a car, you basically take a computer chip and tell the computer chip what the car is going to be. It's going to be this type of car with this kind of trim and paint it red. And you send that chip starts down the line, and as it goes down the line, each robot in turn hears what the chip is saying to it and changes what it does to respond to what the chip's directions are. So in effect, you can do one type of car, you can do a truck after that, you can do a different type of car, you can do a truck after that, and the robots keep changing the assembly process as they go. Okay, so whether you want to call that AI or just extreme flexibility, doesn't make too much difference, but the point is, you're going to be able to run production lines and, or other things like this, where you change what you do and you tailor them very efficiently. Okay. I mean, this has always been a goal in the automotive world. It would be nice if people could order cars and we could assemble the car that they wanted. Okay. But that hasn't been efficient. But the classic idea of how we do production is that we do lots of units at the same time. But robotics and intelligence is changing that. We're going to get to the point where we build one production line and we assemble different types of vehicles on the same line. Okay, so we can do tailoring on demand. Okay, this is City, and this is just a quotation from the head of City, who's basically saying that AI is what they're going to, it's going to be the future of banking. So I'm gonna switch from production and manufacturing to 
to a service business here. According to Citibank, this is the time to get your customers mobile and do their banking online. And if you don't, other banks will. Okay, so this is, this is a little bit off to the side, but AI is going to provide us opportunities and it's going to make it very, it's going to happen relatively quickly and it's going to be very punishing for people who don't keep up. I mean, this is sort of like Amazon all over again. When Amazon first started out, the question was, could it survive? And five years after that, the question was, could publishers survive? And five years after that, the question was, was could any bookstore survive against Amazon? Okay, so I mean, the speed with which the, it changed an entire industry made everybody sit back. And in that case, the change was, there wasn't any AI involved, it was mostly just the fact that the internet empowered that particular company to do that particular thing very well. Okay. Well, Cuckoo, mutual life insurance company. Here's an example that I've spent a bunch of time with. So it's 30 employees who examine medical reports. Okay. They calculate the payouts for policyholders and they were all, 40, 30 of them, were replaced by an AI system. Okay, so what does the AI system have to do in this case? It has to examine pictures and diagrams and read texts that are submitted by doctors. Okay, so they're getting reports from doctors or hospitals. They're reading those reports to determine what kind of payout the insurance company should make to the claimant, the person making the claim. Okay, so... That, that's a lot. In other words, it's, it's sort of easy to think that some pieces of that could be automated, but the, the systems are flexible enough that they can not only read this, this collection of documentation in its various forms, but pull it together and reason about it and reach a decision about what we're talking about in terms of making a claim. Okay, it examines that. The system costs 200 million yen to build, it, co it costs about 15 million a year to maintain. It saves 140 million a year for those 30 employees. So the ROI was considerably under two years. Okay. The second thing that happened is the Japanese Research Institute, which is one of the government's agencies, came in and examined it and put out a report and said 50% of the jobs in Japan could be replaced by 2035 using similar techniques. Okay, now. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But the point is, these are jobs that reasonably short, 10 years ago or five years ago, nobody would have thought could have been automated. We, like, much of the claims for AI suggests that it's different. And my sort of suggestion is, it's really not very different. From my point of view, from the point of view of a business person or a process person, We've been subject to automation now <laughs> since the 70s. It's been picking up speed, but every time you turn around, IT people can do additional things for you. And if you're looking at a process that you have in your company, there are new possibilities, and you decide how much am I willing to invest to get how much more efficiency out of this process. And AI is just a new set of IT techniques that we're now being offered that are going to allow us to automate additional jobs, okay? I mean, we can be dumb about it and read a magazine that says, here's an exciting AI system, and we can say, we want that. Or we can be smart about it, and we can say, we want an efficient company, and we're going to examine our processes in a more or less systematic way and find out where we could get the biggest return by improving, and then say, could AI help us here? I mean, that's what good process people do. They look at, the, they look at for opportunities to make a, a real difference in the, in the output of their company. And AI is going to offer us a bunch of techniques, and if we're smart about it, we're going to be able to use them to increase our efficiency and our effectiveness. Um, just as an aside, sticking with that one for a moment, I, I wrote notes down here about things I'd read in the newspaper in the past two weeks, <laughs> okay? 
And one of them was Foxcom, which is a Chinese assembly company for computers. It assembles both Apple and Samsung computers. They've replaced 60,000 factory workers with robots that now assemble those computers. Okay, so there's 60,000, in that case, production line jobs that have just been eliminated by a robotics robots that are smart enough that they can do very fine assembly work. I mean, when we think of robots, we think of different things, but some of it is vision and getting vision that's very good, and some of it is manipulative stuff and being able to manipulate very fine things, and both of those are on offer at the moment. Okay, FinTech and AI. One of the things about the 80s was that nobody had the tools to build AI systems. And pretty much every AI system we built in the 80s was a one-off because they were expert systems. We were looking for humans that had the expertise and we would go in and duplicate what they did. So if you as a company wanted to do that, you had to find people who could, who could build these expert systems and you had to buy the software, which they refer to as expert system building tools. So you'd buy the, the tool to do the work with, and you'd hire the people who were AI experts, or you'd train people in your company to be AI experts, and then this team would work with your human experts to build this system. I don't think we're going to see too much of that this round. I think what you're going to see is more generic solutions offered by the larger companies as tools that allow you to do a broader collection of things and you're going to use these tools or more likely applications that are two-thirds of the way done and you're only going to put, do finishing on them. I could be wrong, you know, there are, and there certainly will be niches where it will be done differently. But my suggestion is there is a play. There are a bunch of companies that are out there offering tools and products. But my guess is that we're going to see the IBMs and the Microsofts and the, the companies like that who already are doing these things, offering tools that we're going to be able to use so that it'll be more, we certainly we're gonna to have to have people that understand it. But we're going to do less of our own building and more of assembly using these other products. A quick example of that would be natural language. Nobody here wants their company to start from scratch and build a natural language processing system. It's just too complex. You know, let people who understand natural language, let a team of them build a natural language system and then you simply train it to help you do particular things. Okay, so it will be easier or cheaper to buy than to build for much of the time. However, that said, there are certainly going to be companies that are going to build applications and tools and try to sell them. Uh, FinTechs are just financial technology companies that are doing a huge amount of work in the, in the financial industry trying to develop systems that can, can do things. Let's see if I have it here. Uh, well, it's, it, maybe I took it out. There's, uh, there's another slide here. Just a moment. No, I don't have it. Come back to it. Uh, which is, there's a slide referenced in my notes at the end of this. And if you don't get the slides and you simply send me a note of my email address, I'll send them to you. But it's a slide that shows all the different companies that are, that are popular, building popular AI products at the moment. And there are a lot of them. Okay. I switched over here and used some data from IBM. For better or for worse, IBM got a, a big lead in this area. Um, and one of the reasons I tend to use the term cognitive is because IBM is using it. And I think one of the reasons you're seeing a lot of people using AI is that their marketing people don't want to help IBM use cognitive, and so they put the emphasis back on AI. And I don't mind that. The only reason I like cognitive, and I think the main reason IBM chose it, is because I went through the 80s <laughs> using AI. And what we're doing now is different enough that I kind of want a different term to discriminate the neural network approach rather than the rule-based approach. So I want to call that AI and this cognitive, but it, it doesn't make any difference. It's all 
the underlying technology is what it is. In any case, IBM's review here, respondents that have two or more cognitive technologies that have been used for more than a year, 22%. Okay, so 22% of the people who responded had, had some kind of AI they were already using. What were they doing with it? IT was using it in 66% of the cases, data analytics in 59, customer service in 51. So, I mean, this gives you an idea where they're being used. But the point of this is, this is not new now and nobody's used it. This is new now and companies are already using it. Not that you have to play catch up, but at least it's time to be investing in this. The survey continues. 22% of early adopters, what did they do with it? 84% automated scheduling and planning, 80% worked on pattern recognition, 75% knowledge, representation, and reasoning, and so forth. So there's just some ideas about what kinds of things people are already doing. Another aside, and that is, once a technology gets exciting, like AI is at the moment, all kinds of people are gonna say what they're selling is AI, okay? And some, some of the products that they're gonna call AI will have very little AI in them, and some of the things they're gonna call AI are gonna have a lot in them. And it's sort of a buyer beware. You're gonna have to, everything's gonna be AI, so you're gonna have to choose the AI that's best. This is a chart that McKinsey uses a lot, and it's their automation criteria. What they're basically trying to show is what kinds of jobs are easy to automate. And you can see here, predictable physical work is, 70, is 78%, followed by data processing and followed by data collection. And that's sort of predictable. Those are where we've already done most of our automation. Okay. These criteria that McKinsey, they still use these criteria, but these criteria are basically precognitive. So these are the jobs that IT has already been used to automate. And when they do analysis, they, they cite these. Um, AI is just basically going to extend the things we can automate. So if you think of it, just think of the whole series of bars is all raising up a little higher. And you've got AI. In other words, you've got it extending the kinds of things we can automate. Um, in this case, you see that that only 7% were doing things with management. I think AI will be used for a lot of management tasks. You know, we're not talking about replacing senior managers that make anything that I'd call like creative decisions, but we're talking about all kinds of lower middle management people who do lots of data collection and minor analysis. Uh, the people in that insurance company that I mentioned that make decisions about how much payout for customers. If you think of those as management decisions, those kinds of things are going to be automatable now, where they wouldn't have been five years ago. Okay, how to prepare. This is a continuum that Tom Davenport uses, where he says you either buy, you buy some and build some, or you build. I've already suggested, I think, and he has an article about this, which I also cite in the end of the paper if you wanted to uh, look it up. But basically, he says that this market is going to be a buy market, and I sort of agree with him, at least for the first round. Uh, later round, we'll do more building, uh, but, but it'll be buy and build. I think we'll tailor, which is good. I, you know, this, this round of technology is much more complex than the the 80s round, and it's much more difficult to understand the logic. So you have to, you have to trust the person that chooses your neural network algorithm a lot. Um, and if you get it wrong, you won't know that you won't for sure that you got it wrong. So you're gonna have to buy, get somebody who has good knowledge of this and who has experience with it. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about IBM's Watson. And I want to qualify this. I, I'm not pro-IBM, and I'm not pro-Watson as such. IBM got in early, and they put a lot of money into their research, and they got early results. And so 
they have data that we can look at that's useful to get ideas about what's going to happen next. All the other major players in the market are right on their heels, and different players have different advantages. So where IBM is working with industrial customers for certain types of applications, Microsoft is going to invest very heavily in putting tools into products that we all use on our laptops, you know, tools that programmers use to build small applications in, in, the, in the Microsoft world are going to all become much easier to use and much more clever. They're going to build natural language into lots of things that will build on those types of platforms. Google will do the same thing <laughs> for the web. Okay, so there's going to be, this AI is going to get packaged in lots of different ways by all the major players, and they're going to insert it into their products. But let's, if we stick with IBM for just a second, first of all, IBM says the company is totally committed to AI, but it's their future. Uh, they built this platform, Watson, which is a, a whole collection of tools, basically, to build applications with. But I wanted to go through and point out some of these apps that they're selling, not because they're the best, but because these are, thing, these are areas where IBM has shown that Watson can be effective. Okay, so there are areas that we all want to look at in our own companies and say, do, do these apply to us? And if they do, then we know that certain things AI can do will be useful because IBM has shown it, and they'll offer, if you want, to sell their version of the thing for you to tailor for your particular problem. So in industry, safety analysis, technical support services, procurement intelligence, and cognitive vehicles, smart driving vehicles. In the telecom industry, a telecom digital agent, that's a, something to answer the phone to solve problems. In retail, natural language systems that help embed, that are embedded into monitoring, into customer answering of questions, into smart analysis, and to evaluate data and trends. Okay. One of the big areas that AI has been used in, a lot of companies are already doing data analytics, and a little bit of AI can make data analytics much smarter. The way it is now, you have a huge amount of data and you want to analyze for a trend, you use one of the algorithms that are available in, in, data, in analytics to, to look for the trend. You use an AI system, and it will apply 15 different analytics and check them against each other and come back and show you the best result. So it does more faster than a human would do and gives you the results faster. Okay, so a lot of people who are already doing analytics have just added AI to make it faster and smarter, more flexible. Uh, financial services, a digital virtual agent for insurance and for banking. Again, Digital agents, and we're using them in this case, means somebody to answer the phone, somebody to look at information that's coming in in various forms. Uh, smarter advisor. Uh, advisor, in this case, is a system that's, that's hearing customers make requests and then re coming back with recommendations. So poor wealth management, broker dealers, private banking, discounting. Okay, cost sector. I love this one. City Analytics is a service that IBM is selling. They take particular cities, say Lisbon, and then they gather huge amounts of data about Lisbon. They gather this data and they analyze it and then get very particular about it. So if you decide you want to locate branch stores, they can give you a huge amount of information immediately about where you might want to locate those branch stores. And then they'll continue to gather data. You decide you want to launch an, an ad campaign They'll not only tell you where people are, but they'll tell you about any trends that are going on. Uh, they'll tell you about weather. They'll tell you about uh, festivals that may be going on that may interfere with your, your marketing strategy. So this availability of a system that gathers, constantly gathers huge amounts of data and analyzes it in all kinds of different ways but then will respond to your requests for particular information and lot, provide a lot of additional suggestions. I like it because it's a generic solution. In other words, as opposed to the more specific ones, this is one that's really applying intelligence very broadly and offering you good advice about things that you might not even think to ask. Okay. 
Who else is active in cognitive and AI? Everybody. Okay, I already mentioned this. Anybody? One of the things that emerges from what I'm saying is that data is very important. Okay, think twice if you're letting somebody else manage all your data and you don't have secure access to it. Okay, if your company generates a lot of data, then you have a very valuable resource because the AI learning systems can use that data to learn from. If you don't have the data, somebody else has the data, then you have a problem because somebody else has control over what you need to make certain kinds of decisions. Google has a contract in the UK with the National Health Services. They're building a system in the UK that will monitor all data for all patients in the National Health Services. They're going to use this information in real time to track everything that's being done but to every patient and the outcome. Okay, this is a database they're going to be building over the next several years. The objection raised by some in the British government is that Google will end up owning the National Health Service. Well, that's not quite correct, but what Google is going to be able to do is to learn about diseases and learn about predictors for diseases and learn about what treatments work and how effectively they work. And they're going to have that data available in real time for all of the systems they're going to build in the healthcare area. It's going to be very valuable. Okay, so somebody has to do it. Google's the one that's lined up to do it. If you're a company, you want to think very carefully about who you're going to let do what with your data and what kind of control you're going to have over it. Ah, here's my fortune chart, and you, obviously you can't read it, but the point is, <laughs> up at the top you have the United States, and then down a little bit you have Europe, the American chart, and at the bottom <laughs> you have Asia, and then you have these lines representing all the different companies going out there, and there are 50 of them. These are supposedly the top 50 that Fortune magazine identified. Um, and then they cluster them, so that different areas. So the biggest one clustered is core AI, which doesn't say much. But you've got other areas for financial and for sales and for marketing. So these are companies that are specializing in, and they're going to offer apps in these different areas. Okay. Um, let's skip that. So it's, this, this is simply, what do we do as process people? And the first question, I'm a process person, so I say the first question is come up with an architecture and understand what your processes are. Um, follow that by having some sort of a flow chart that says what are the major steps in my process. And then say where, where would make a difference? If I could do one of these activities better than the others, would that save me a lot of money? Would it make me a lot of money? This is what process people do all the time. So I'm not saying do anything different, and that's the point I'm emphasizing. You, know, you have to know your processes, you have to know where the problems are, and then the question of AI is simply going back and looking at what you have and looking for opportunities. So at the top up there, I have a column which shows what the customer does, what are the customer's activities. And I've got a circle over there that says, what do we expect the customer to do, and how could we improve it? Where could we use natural language so that the customer could ask questions and get answers? Okay, reserve a car. How do we interact with the customer? What decisions are made in which one of the activities? Same thing, you know, what visual checks are made? Where could we use visual robotics to improve checks that we make? Uh, prepare, clean car, prepare car. Could this be done by a robotic system? Sure. Data, what data do you already have? What data could you use? And then finally, I put in the blue, if you want a transformative consideration, should we be renting cars that drive themselves? Okay, so you've got the whole range. You've got the problems you have now and all of the things that AI can do to make those problems less bothersome, and then you've got the transformative questions about what could we really do to make it a very different kind of business. Considerations. Projects. 
Are you just going to start learning? Or do you want to reinvent your organization? How much of a commitment are you making here? People, do you want to oversee learning? Or do you want, neuro, or do you want to develop neural network systems? Most of you are not going to want to develop neural network systems. So you're going to want to develop people who have uh, uh, an ability to tailor rather than an ability to create. Uh, software, are you going to insert this into an existing process? In which case, you're looking for a piece of AI that fits into something you're already doing and that's compatible with systems you already have. Or do you want to build a new application? Management, uh, how are you going to stay on top of this? I'd suggest that if you're a large company at all, you're going to want to set up a, a, an AI team if you don't have it already. And you're going to want to start hiring some people that can stay on top of this. It's not a thing you can buy. It's a whole collection of tools and apps that work in different places doing different things. You're going to need somebody that monitors this on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis and is able to evaluate what's available, where is it getting results, what kind of results are it getting. And this is going to change. As I say, I have a whole list of things that I picked up in the last two weeks. And anybody you set up on a team like this is going to be able to accumulate the same kinds of information reasonably quickly. So the time now to have somebody in the company that's monitoring AI. OK, summary. I wish things would slow down, but they haven't. And they haven't slowed down since the 70s, and they're not going to slow down in the next 10 years. They're going to accelerate. For better or for worse, you know, it's, it's going to get more complex to understand even what the options are. OK, you're going to have to build systems that can do that, monitor, and then try to figure out how to take this information you're getting, evaluate it, decide where you get the biggest return, and try that first. Okay, most companies are going to depend on vendor apps. You're not going to want to try to build this stuff from scratch, certainly not at the beginning. You're going to want to hire people who have some knowledge of AI and can help install systems that other people build. In fact, it would be very hard for you to hire a serious AI person at this point in time. The large companies are all going out of their way to spend large amounts of money to recruit people right out of the universities in AI. Okay, so unless you've got a lot of money, you're going to find that you couldn't afford to hire the kind of talent you need to build one of these systems from scratch. Well, that's not really where you want to put your emphasis. You want to put it on, at least for the first round, finding applications that can be applied and hiring people who are good at helping you apply them. OK, data is going to be a key. Large amount of data is going to be critical, being able to build lots of these applications, to train the AI application to get for the systems to be able to learn. And so you need to know what your data is now and know what kind of plans you have for the future to control it. And finally, now is the time. It's, it's, uh, it's easy to think of AI, if you read some of these articles, as still in the future and still unclear. But the problem is that there is so much of it. And it comes in so many different areas. Some of it is in the future. Some of it is not ready for you to use in your company. Some of it is. IBM, I mentioned them. <laughs> They're selling those applications today. They have 30 different applications that they have built for other companies that have already been used. They can provide you the data on. And those applications are ready to tailor for your company. And just like IBM, Google, and Microsoft, and all of the other leading companies are getting ready to do the same thing. They're going to offer you suites of tools and types of applications you can build into your existing things. So the time is now to be figuring out the best way to do this. You don't want to be <laughs> like a retailer or like a book publisher and, and waiting for Am to see what Amazon is going to do. Ten years from now, it's going to be a little bit too late. 
Um, I do have a reference as to most of what I've said. And as I say, if, if you don't, do they have sli my slides? Okay, I, send me one more here. There we go. S it's, send me an email if you want, and I will be glad to send you a copy of my slides. Um, go out and build AI systems. Thank you very much.